So hi, everybody. My name is Greg Epstein. I am not your previously scheduled moderator, and I, I probably will just be your moderator for the first few minutes of this panel. But I was just asked by Ibu Patel, um, one of my real heroes and, and, and friends in the world, um, but you know somebody whose work I've just admired since pretty much since he started doing it, getting back from Oxford almost two decades ago. Uh, I've just been asked by Ibu just to, just to take over for a couple minutes while he's having some technical difficulties and get this panel started. Um, so uh, who has asked each of us uh, that are on the panel to go around and share a brief story or reflection um, about four minutes long or so, um, no longer than that pretty much uh, about um, either a positive or a negative experience that we've had um, in our work you know, working to bridge differences or working from a religious or spiritual or secular place um, in uh, some kind of interfaith dialogue. And, you know, I think he's got a great plan for how we're going to integrate those experiences once we go forward. But I'm going to go ahead and just share mine. And then when I'm done, we'll have plenty of time for the other panelists. And I'm sure by that point, we'll bring Ibu back in. Okay. So I'm going to read you the first line of an op-ed that I wrote for CNN.com uh, on what I guess otherwise was a slow news day in May 2010, which was uh, a less complicated time for sure. And, and, and this was actually at one point, bizarrely, CNN's lead story on their website. <laughs> it began as follows. If I told you groups of atheist and Muslim students around the country have been breaking out boxing gloves and the outlines of bodies have been marked in chalk on the ground, you'd worry, right? And you should, though fortunately it doesn't mean anyone has been physically hurt yet. Well, the basic idea of that piece um, is that in the early days of the Obama administration, I was chairing the advisory board of the Secular Student Alliance, a board including noted fellow atheists, uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris, all best-selling authors and uh, the three of the four horsemen of the new atheist apocalypse, if you're not familiar. Um, Though that crew and I never met in person, um, my advisory post was largely ceremonial, or at least I'd never managed to make more out of it until that moment. Uh, a South Park episode depicted the Prophet Muhammad wearing a bear suit, pushing the boundaries ever farther in the then uber trendy show's effort to demonstrate that no icon or belief of any faith, political or cultural affiliation was too sacred to be held up to mockery. Now, this struck me as skirting the line, but I could at least see the argument on both sides, especially when threats of violence emerged against anyone who drew the profit. The situation lurched over the line and into a full-fledged dumpster fire, however, when groups of students within the Secular Student Alliance, the organization for which I was chair of advisors, decided to respond to the South Park episode by organizing a campaign to draw stick figures on the ground in the center of their campuses, labeling those drawings also in chalk, Muhammad. This caused maximum offense among Muslims who believed that both drawing and stepping on any depiction of the Prophet Muhammad were major offenses. A, a virally trending scandal ensued. Now for me, as a non-religious chaplain who by definition works in an interfaith context, and I was also an active, passionate supporter of Ibu's IFYC organization at that time, I felt torn between supporting the atheist and agnostic students with whom I've dedicated my career to working and acknowledging the Muslim students I knew were feeling justly attacked, targeted, scared. Um, how to respond? Ultimately, I took my cue from some brilliant Muslim student activists who brought bright, who bought bright red chalk, drew boxing gloves on the stick figures, and changed their names from Muhammad to Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Absolutely genius. Um, in my op-ed, I told the secular students, 
that they were entitled to do what they'd done, but that their actions were also unwise and a failure of compassion. But more importantly than anything I said, the two sides on their own decided to sit down to talk. Now, I don't know if any lives were changed in that moment, but I can say this. In the ensuing years, I've seen atheists and secular students work together more and get along better with and even learn a lot from Muslim and other religious student groups. I, I hope and believe we've had also a few things to teach along the way as well, but society as a whole is dealing with so many problems we barely envisioned back in 2010. But to me, the state of interfaith dialogue as it pertains to groups like mine is clearly better. I guess what I'm saying is a hard story about interfaith engagement can also become a great story in the end. So uh, that's my contrib contribution. And I think we've got Ibu back online. Yes, Greg, thank you for that. And thank you for uh, for taking over both the moderating role briefly and and also um, and also sharing your story here. Forgive the technical difficulties, uh, friends. Thank you uh, to the panelists for being with us. Thank you to the community for gathering. This is going to be, I think, a, a very exciting session. It has already started off as such. Um, uh, I want to frame the session in this way. Oftentimes when we think about the civil rights movement and the way that it is presented, if you watch uh, Ava DuVernay's great film, Selma, it is uh, a movement that is nurtured by faith communities uh, and that is led by faith leaders. Uh, and I think about you know, Brown Chapel in Selma, Alabama. I think, uh, uh, um, I think about Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and a group of Christian leaders kneeling in prayer at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And over and over again, there are these images and these stories of people of faith, uh, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and others who are leading a faith-based movement. And if we think about so many of the social justice movements today, that is not principally how they are framed. And the purpose of this whole conference is can we build more bridges? And so the conference organizers had this brilliant idea of let's talk about bridges between faith-oriented social justice movements and secular-oriented social justice movements. And let's think about ways that these things have are working together now and ways in which they might work together better. Greg just shared a story of, um, of an effort in which he successfully bridged an enormously challenging, intense situation within uh, the expression of secular and atheist students and, uh, the, um, and the, the offense taken by Muslim students and how Muslim students in their deafness in this case uh, uh, managed a very challenging situation and how Greg in, in both secular humanist and interfaith wisdom was a part of that. What I had hoped to do was to ask each person to go around and share an experience, to begin with a brief introduction of themselves and to share an experience of whether when they had seen faith-based and secular social justice leaders either working well together or not working well together. So Greg has shared his experience. Um, I wanna turn to Pat. Uh, who I had the opportunity to be with in the previous main stage session and ask if you would share an experience also. And we'll do this kind of round robin style um, and we'll get a set of experiences on the table and then I'll ask a couple of questions from there. Pat. Thank you, Ibu. I'm so I'm glad we got that worked out for you. Um, so I, um, I actually told the story I intended to tell here on the last panel. So I'm thinking about um, what I wanna say here. Um, you know, I think I'm going to point to Standing Rock. So for those of you who aren't aware, Standing Rock is um, is is one of the Lakota um, or Dakota, excuse me, uh, indigenous nations um, in, in North Dakota. <clears throat> and there was uh, a stand made there by the people of Standing Rock, the indigenous people there, to um, stand against a, an oil pipeline being brought under the Cannonball River which was uh, their, the source of water for life in their area. And um, many of you may know that it attracted a lot of worldwide attention. Um, many different indigenous peoples came to join, which um, those of you who work in social justice movements know that's not necessarily an easy thing to come by is to have your, your own people band together sometimes, but that happened there along with many other different um, indigenous nations. Um, but I really want to point to because my children went there, and so I was I was 
I, I was not called to be there myself, but I was watching my children be there. And, you know, there was one point where, where uh, Chief Archambault of, of the Chief of the Standing Rock Nation um, called for clergy from all faiths to come and stand on the front line because they were um, bodily, you know, putting themselves in, in the way of, of that progress of that, of that um, construction of that pipeline. And there was um, private security that was being called in and even US military being called in to defend a corporation in that, in that situation here. Um, so it was enemies domestic, I guess you could say. Um, but what I really want to point to is Chief Archambault called on clergy to come and stand with, with the indigenous peoples and all the peoples who had gathered there. And what he said was, he said, they don't, they don't see us when we're praying. Our prayers don't look like prayers to them. They can't, they can't see us as human beings in prayer. They can barely see us as human beings. And so we're calling on the clergy to come and join us. Because if you come and join us and you come and stand on the front lines where the rubber bullets are, are happening, where they're bringing dogs, et cetera. This was uh, not that long ago, right? Five years ago. Um, then they will, and you come and pray. They'll recognize you as being people, human beings praying and they'll ease up. So we call on you to come and join us here on the front line. And I believe there was about 800 clergy came to join the people on that front line. I was grateful because <laughs> I had sons there. I had young, young, young men warriors there. So I was grateful for that de-escalation. And then what I, what I saw in addition to that was that um, all of those 800 clergy were trained in nonviolent direct action. They took them all into the school gymnasium and everybody got a training all together. And I thought, wow, think about all those people now being able to go out and being able to, to stand if called in that same way. And then the final thing they did, which is very emotional for me, is they had a ceremony in which they took a copy of the Doctrine of Discovery and made ceremony and acknowledged that it was had long since been refuted as being valid, you know, because it was saying that indigenous peoples, anybody who was not of the one true faith was not human, was some kind of lower being of a human animal and therefore their lands could be taken. Their lands were void, terra nullis. And so these clergy stood with indigenous people and acknowledged that there's no possible way that there could be any valid logic or legal standing with that. And together they burned that copy of the Doctrine of Discovery. And so that's one of the most radical instances that I can think of that my family was involved in. Oh, I didn't say where I was from. I just wanna say I'm speaking from my mother's house in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm from Diné Nation. And um, my mom and I are, are buddies here. She's 97 years old. And um, it's a real honor to be on this panel with the rest of my colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you for sharing that powerful story. Uh, ben, can we turn to you for a brief introduction of who you are and uh, your story of positive cooperation or challenging tension? Thanks so much for being a part of the conversation. Uh, Pat, great to see you again, uh, to, to hear your voice. and and. I was moved by that story. Uh, ben McBride, I'm a native of uh, Fris California, San Francisco, uh, but us native folk, we don't call it San Fran. So I'm from Frisco. Uh, my grandmother moved uh, to Oakland, um, of which I lived, you know, for over 10 years, uh, fleeing oftentimes, I like to say, to Jim's, Jim Crow and uh, my crazy ass grandfather, Jim McBride. Um, and found a way to try to figure out how to help our family survive the racism of the South. Uh, over the last um, decade or so, I've been living at the intersection of um, seeking to try to um, end the epidemic of community gun violence, uh, as well as the pandemic of police violence in a variety of different ways. Uh, primarily that as a part of uh, our live free movement. It's good to see Sister T. I'm happy to hear what she has to share, but a lot of us have grown up in a lot of this work together over the last decade, starts and stops. And currently right now I'm the founder of Empower Initiative and 
Live Free California, where we're still trying to continue to do that work and figure out how we bridge folks across difference. I think the conversation to me that's meaningful about um, what does it mean to be a person of faith? Obviously, I got my costume on, as y'all can see. I wore it uh, important because this is the way that I've often shown up in public space attention because I come out of the tradition uh, of the, um, you know, Kingian model of direct action and nonviolence and trying to think about how do we actually um, bring about change uh, through that kind of power building. And, and so I've shown up in places a lot um, with this clerical uh, uniform on. And I, I thought about one of the moments that really moved me and really challenged me was um, in August of 2014, uh, when Michael Brown was murdered by uh, Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. And at that time, I was engaged in a lot of community gun violence work um, in Oakland, California. Um, my brother, Mike McBride, who's also kind of an activist and leader, is my blood brother, is the one that actually pulled me into all of this crazy work. But in any case, he was in Ferguson, Missouri and, and was calling me on the phone and telling me that, you know, what was happening to the young people there and uh, that he was being called uh, monkeys and told to go back to Africa by white police officers. And... Um, and so when I ended up going to Ferguson, I didn't just go for Michael, uh, Michael Brown, but I also went for Mike McBride, my brother. And, and I showed up in that place fully ready to think about what did it mean for me to be there? Who did I need to become to be on that journey um, to, to stand uh, alongside the struggle of folks who were there? Uh, but one of the things I realized when I got there was that there were a lot of non-religious young people that were actually leading that movement, the folks who were um, standing on the front lines, facing down the tear gas and the and the tanks at night uh, when all of the people of faith would go home. And uh, when I arrived in this, that I would be welcome. Uh, they told me, what y'all doing out here? Uh, get y'all ass out of here. Y'all, we don't need y'all out here. And what I had to realize in that moment was that they weren't so much um, in conflict with me, but they were in conflict with my uniform and, and the reality of the way in which this uniform has uh, participated in a lot of trauma uh, for of people, people um, across many generations. Uh, the opportunity that I found in that moment was um, by our willingness um, to not take it personal, but actually to lean in and bridge uh, with these young people that were standing on the front lines for justice who were not, not share my uh, religious orientation. Um, we were able to make some strides together. There were some shifts that had to happen for us or we began to follow the leadership of the young people who were engaged and did not share our point of view and allow ourselves to let go of our historical and the American story leadership function and actually follow the leadership of those uh, with whom a sense of leadership has not been recognized. Uh, and I think about one primary moment where Dr. West was there with us and we were having this uh, kind of big uh, community session and the young people got up in the middle of it and turned their back to Dr. West, turned their back to all the faith leaders. And in essence, they challenged us and said, if y'all aren't willing to turn up with us outside tomorrow, um, then why don't y'all just go home and get the F up out of here? And I realized in that moment that that actually wasn't conflict or confrontation, it was an invitation. And so myself and many others, we took that invitation that next day and began to follow the leadership and join in with young people that did not share our religious orientation, to join them in the streets, to join them uh, in direct action, to join them in going to jail. And that when we found ourselves uh, being released from jail the next day, uh, the lobby was filled with some of these same young people who didn't share our religious orientation, who said, now we know that you all are really about this work and that you really love us. And what it showed me is that if we're going to really engage in bridging across the notion of faith and difference, it's not just about conversation, but it's also about our willingness uh, to sacrifice, uh, not just with each other, but for each other. They're powerful, powerful stories. Thank you, Reverend McBride. Very grateful for that. Um, Deb, may I ask you to share next? Sure, thank you. And it's nice to see my neighbor, Reverend Ben. Um, I'm Deb Noyley. I'm, I serve as a rabbi at Kehillah Community Synagogue, which is on Lashon Ohlone land, uh, territory of Huchin. And um, Ours is a community of about 500 member households centered on justice building and Jewish practice. And through that, many 
different groups of people within our community are organizing in many different areas of justice work. Um, but after seeing the opening panel yesterday, I realized that the place where this tension, um, both the tension and the generativity between uh, secular and religious being and approaches is really most profound for me within our community. And um, the story I wanted to share is that several years ago, we had the opportunity to, to paint our sanctuary and that was to put a quote, um, a quote up on the wall. And we had to decide as a community, what was the quote that was gonna embody our identity, our sense of ourselves as a community. And we had three candidates for that quote. And uh, I wanna share the one that emerged as, as the one I'll say it in, in Hebrew and then and then translate it. It says, Uva shofar gadol yitaka, vakol damama daka, vakol damama daka kishama, which means the great shofar is sounded and a still small voice is heard. And for us, the great shofar is a symbol of this and the call to liberation and the sound that will happen at the beginning of the the, the era of a of a jubilee of a collective liberation. And the still small voice is this inner connection to, to truth that's available to us in the quiet. And what's notable to me is what's missing from that quote, which is any reference to God. And that was, um, that was a requirement that emerged in our community, because our community is made up of of people who share uh, progressive commitment to justice and share a desire to be in Jewish community, but don't share any particular religious or theological uh, grounding. And in fact, many to be part of this either because of an ethnic or ancestral connection to Jewishness that may or may not have anything to do with spiritual practice or relationship to God or theology. And other people are drawn very because of uh, wanting to be part of a community of spiritual practice and Jewish spiritual practice and deepening relationship to God. And they may or may not have any connection to um, Jewish identity or Jewish ancestry. And it was a, um, it was one of the people in our community who has quite a deep relationship to God who insisted that the quote that we choose be one that not include a reference to God so that everybody would feel uh, included and welcomed. And I think this, um, for me, this, this question that we're, we're approaching around othering, belonging, and bridging exists in these big ways across communities, but also exists, I think, in an everyday way within our communities. And our capacity to build relationships around families, around personal experience, shared meals. That's what allows us to hold the tension between these very different poles and commitments. Um, and, and, and I think people often feel, even within a community like this, that there may be no place for them, either because of their relationship to religion or because of their lack of relationship to religion. Loving, I'm loving all these cases. Thank you so much for that. Kashif. Sorry, that took me longer than it needed to, to unmute myself. Uh, hello, um, hello everyone. My name is Kashif Sheikh. I am the co-founder and president of the Pillars Fund, an organization that amplifies and supports American Muslim communities around the country. I'm incredibly honored to be here. I will keep my remarks short because I think there's so many um, incredible people on this panel who we're all so excited to hear from. So I wanted to share uh, something that I have thought long and hard about. You know, I started the Pillars Fund about 10 years ago, and, and, and part of the reason why I started the organization was I was always really thinking a lot about ways that Muslim communities could show up and visibly show up for 
other, not just faith communities, but other movements. Um, I, I was incredibly influenced at a young age by you know a group of friends who all fell into activism through gay rights, through marriage equality, through um, a number of different issues. You know, in the late '90s and uh, early 2000s in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where I grew up. And one of the things that I thought a lot about was in the immigrant Muslim community. Uh, there was a lot of um, this was a community that was you know. The, and I'm talking specifically about the immigrant Muslim community, was relatively new in the United States, 30, 40 years, and had been building a lot of mosques and sort of trying to build new ways of, new sort of centers of worship for our communities. But one of the things that had always enamored me about the faith was its sort of community aspect. And I never saw that really come to fruition in a way that I did uh, in 2016, 2017, early 2017, which is, um, I don't need to remind everyone here when, you know, uh, former President Trump uh, won that election. And one of the, the, the big platforms that he ran on was the Muslim ban. And as you can imagine, you know, the, you know, as a Muslim specifically, sort of seeing someone be able to win an election on such a uh, w when that was such a clear and and, and pillar of his uh, platform was incredibly disheartening, um, and that was until you know the early 2017 protests uh, at the airport protests, which many of you may remember. Um, I have to be really honest with you; those days were amongst the most moving I'd ever seen in my life. I, they brought me to tears. I, I live in Chicago. And we were watching these protests come to light and they were not small protests. They were really, really big protests at airports. And then we started to see on social media that they weren't just happening in Chicago. They were happening all around the country. And one of the things that I think often gets uh, overlooked in those moments and those sort of big moments of social change is the role that faith communities play in organizing. And uh, one of the things that I really, as I started to think about, I, you know, I honestly, for me, I got to attend those as a citizen. I often, you know, as the, the president of Pillars, uh, as I'm sure everyone here can relate to, sort of has to show up in these spaces as a leader. And to be honest, I was too beaten down and exhausted to be able to show up and, and really wanted to let the young activists on the ground do the, you know, really sort of lead us. And I showed up as a citizen and to see that the these multiple faith communities had come together and really made a statement. It still makes me emotional when I think about it, um, it you know, really make a statement and stood with Muslims. I saw things like, you know, organizations, local grassroots organizations deploying lawyers to, you know, like that were literally on the ground uh, for people that were coming through or needed to get out. Um, there was there was there was such an intensely um, powerful feeling of people of all faith or non faith um, of all stripes coming together to stand for Muslims in the United States. And I thought about that a lot. And I still think about that a lot because, you know, as as a leader in my own community, <laughs> I will always be someone that um, will be as as critical as I can of my own communities and our efforts to be there for the people who've always been there for us. And I think when you're involved, when you're you were sort of you're in it, it's easier to sort of see, you know, all the things that you could be doing or the things that you're not doing. And that was one of those moments that I really sort of inspired me to think about ways that we, how would we show up for other communities and other movements in that? Because what it did was it it brought me uh, it, it was it was the first moment of uh, maybe relief is too strong of a word, but you know, in such a horrible time, it brought me some level of optimism that, regardless of what they are trying to to push forward, that young leaders, faith leaders, non faith leaders were going to come together and really push back against this. Uh, and I think often about the the days after nine eleven when I think about uh, our um, excuse me our Sikh brothers and sisters. <laughs> 
who were there for uh, for Muslim communities. And I'll always think about ways that Muslim communities can continue to be there. Um, and, and I think that it's something that I always want us to be pushing. It's something that I always want us to, to be thinking about our, our leaders, because these are complex, intersectional issues that require all of us to really be there and, and be loving one another and supporting one another. So um, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, otherwise, I may actually go into tears because it was such a powerful moment. But um, I, will, I will pause there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kashif. Tamisha, take us out uh, of, this, of this segment. Can everyone hear me? Um, hello, everyone. Tamisha Torres Walker, co founder, executive director of Safe Return Project in Contra Costa, California. Um, just want to say that I'm uh, appreciative and blessed to, sh to have in my experience as an organizer and an activist to share space with clergy who do not uphold capitalism, who are not sexist and who actually um, allow agitation in spaces from people like me who um, do not believe like, you know, when when I'm thinking about the story that I want to talk about, it also just makes me think about when I heard about this topic and it says secular, well, I didn't know that I was a part of the secular community. I just thought that I was somebody that wasn't willing to be bound by religion and willing to allow myself to be free spiritually and lean into my faith and belief around what you know what should happen around liberation for my people but also what roots me in my community and so it's really interesting because i didn't know i was a part of that community a secular community so that just highlights some of the challenges around differences that we make when we tie religion um, to people's personal experience so in richmond my first some of my first organizing experiences were with with the faith community was around gun violence and good to see you here brother ben and you know, really um, addressing these issues as somebody who was impacted by gun violence growing up and had a family who was impacted by gun violence and not really knowing how to navigate faith communities, but knowing that we were all showing up for one purpose and that was to reduce gun violence in our community was enough for me. Um, it was also enough for people who considered themselves to be atheists to show up because even though we didn't have similar religions, practices or beliefs, we all had a collective value in life, right? We wanted people to be alive and free in their communities. Now, I remember one night we were doing a night walk. It's what they call a night walk. It's to connect these fire efforts to reduce violence. And it was in what people seen as one of the most violent communities in, in Richmond. And so we're taking this night walk and it's faith leaders and it's formerly incarcerated people and it's very diverse. And we come up on a group of young men in front of a liquor store and, and we, hand them the pamphlets and we're talking about gun violence and their community and what they want to see and they know a lot of us right some of these faces are familiar to them right because they grew up around these faith leaders and, and a lot of some of what the young people that they engaged were saying was like if they were shocked to see the clergy in the street um because they didn't see them like that in the community and so but they knew of them and were aware of them through grandmothers mothers etc and so we we stopped and sometimes the group would offer prayer to folks which i absolutely appreciated um we had to fight back evangelizing because that wasn't what we were there for we weren't there to convert people away from whatever, we were there to say, we want you alive and free. So we struggled with that. But what we landed on was prayer, that we all believed that that was okay to offer. And we offered prayer to these young men and one young man accepted prayer. And so the group surrounded him and began to pray with him as he was in the middle and his friends were off to the side. And a and they dropped their heads and started praying as well. So they didn't want to, they didn't directly engage. They didn't accept the prayer outright, but they respected it. They respected that space. And they stood off to the side and they bowed their heads and prayed as well. And then when the prayer was over, the young man thanked us, his friends nodded their heads, and then we went on about our business. But what was triggering in that, is that one of the faith leaders in the group 
had a lot of negative things to say about the young men who didn't directly accept prayer. And I think it was unfortunate because he was so focused on, he, he wasn't aware that the young men did pray. And, and it was interesting to me because he, he, he considered them to be lost, to needed to be saved, to needing all of these things, but he didn't even see them praying. And that was concerning to me because I'm like, well, how do we how do we work together as, as people of faith and 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 secular communities, right? When like sometimes there is a lot of judgment about what you don't see or refuse to see. And I think that's that's what's been the most challenging for myself as an organizer in spaces where it's multi-faith and we're talking about engaging people in communities and frontline communities who are struggling the most um, is that there, there's an idea that somebody is either not saved or doesn't have faithful values, but that's just because we don't know people or take the time to see people. And so I appreciate the conversation today. I heard a lot of great um, s stories around like how you bridge the gap or like a bridge. And I think the first part is like the foundation needs to be laid that like absent collective religion or what we consider to be faith, we are human beings first. I mean, what a what a rich set of stories. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so I'm gonna we have about we have about uh, 15 minutes left. I want to open up with one question, and then as I do that and see see if people have thoughts about this, um, to invite folks to write questions in the chat, and I'll I'll get to as many as I can in, in the brief time that we have left. But one of one of the things that that's interesting about different religious communities and secular communities as well is that they actually have different views of justice, right? And I actually want to say that again. Um, the, the term social justice is, is not often defined. It's used as if it means one thing to everybody. It has a single definition. And I'm curious how people here can help us think about what happens when different communities have different definitions of justice and they're actually in conflict with each other. So for example, um, uh, I, I ran into a Hindu friend um, uh, a day or two after, after Eid a couple of years ago. And uh, the, there, there's two Eids in Islam. There's one, one Eid called Bakr Eid, with, which comes at the end of the Hajj, in which Muslims are virtually obligated to slaughter a goat and you use, it is, it is part of the religion. It is a ritual of the religion. You keep a third of the goat for your family to eat. You give a third to, to friends and family, and you give a third to the poor. It's called Qurbani, it's a sacrifice. It's, it is based on the story of in Islam, Abraham and Ishmael, and in Christianity and Judaism, Abraham and Isaac. And um, you know, ran it to my Hindu friend, uh, he said Eid Mubarak to me, uh, and then, you know, he said, you know, Eid is actually very painful for me. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, in Hinduism, we don't kill animals for food. It's a justice issue. And actually in Jainism and Buddhism as well. There are clearly other examples of religious traditions that have different definitions of justice. Um, abortion would be one. Reformed Jews and more conservative Catholics would view it very differently, <clears throat> right? But I wanted to use an example that's actually not at the center of the American political radar screen, you know, in which we don't immediately kind of go to our respective corners the way that we would around abortion, for example. Can you help me think about whether Muslims are being unjust when we perform the rituals around Eid, or whether um, Hindus are wrong to think that killing animals for food is a justice issue. How should I think about this? Pat. 
I'm not sure if if I'm. Can you hear me? Yes. I think I'm not the one who unmutes. Um, thank you for that. Um, you know, I've been saying this thing uh, in the last couple of years, um, where I'm saying that culture is not a human construct. Culture is the Mother Earth expressing herself as human being in any given place. And so, um, to have to be indigenous means to be of place, very deeply of place. And that means that um, we have our we have a a relationship. I mean, we can call it reciprocal. We can call it um, uh, synergistic. <clears throat> um, but it's also deeply spiritual. And so if we think about when I think about it that way, I think about, um, you know, like my my clothing, like even here today, I'm wearing this turquoise. It's become a medicine for us. There's a way that we can stay well. And this stone come, came out of the ground where my people have been for millennia. And um, and and so so there's certain traditions that arise um, in these different places and in these different relationships. And um, so that, that's one of my taglines that I say about why it's relevant to have me come and speak somewhere because it's not enough for me to be a cultural show and tell for the world. I feel that, you know, I say if sustainability were the highest and most sought after technology on the planet, who should we be talking to? We should be talking to those peoples who've known how to live in one place over an extended period of time, 1,000 years, 5,000 years, 10,000 years, 15,000 years or, or more. Right. <clears throat> and so, so I, I, the world, the world is shifting and changing. We can't only go by that, but I pay attention to those peoples and their, and, and look at where their traditions come from directly from their surroundings. Um, and so that's part of the way that we've been able to maintain those, that sustainability of living in place for such long periods of time is by, by listening. And that means we have to move beyond the intellect. We have to open up to a very broad spectrum of ways of knowing in order to be able to perceive how the earth is describing to us the way of thriving life. And so I feel like uh, my elders have impressed upon me that, you know, so, so for instance, my people, Diné Nation surrounds Hopi Nation, like Hopi Nation is an entirely different people, an island in the middle of us. They have a completely different cosmology, creation story, language structure, social structure, everything. And yet we've lived side by side in that, in that configuration for thousands of years. We don't feel the need to try to tell them how to be Diné. Like we trust that whatever they're receiving in their relationship between earth and cosmos is correct. And in fact, they know how to make life, cause life to thrive as do we. So we visit them with curiosity rather than um, a need to homogenize, I guess you could say, or conform. And so I like to think about that, uh, I'll stop with this, I like to think about that, that at one point on this continent, just imagine all the thousands of cultures that live side by side. And so we not only had um, land management practices that allowed for sustainability, we also had social technologies that allowed us to have sustainable relationships such that we could um, not have to um, absorb each other necessarily. Thank so you I like for that. That's, that's a powerful, powerful framing. And just any, any other, and then we'll go on to I, see. I, guess I, yeah, wanted, on, I guess, I guess I was curious because I think this was a question of what is just or, or, or unjust, right? As, as far as practices, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to understand because you 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 mentioned justice. And yes, so yes. yeah, and so it's like this is a big a, a bigger conversation than we can like tackle today, but I'm just wondering is because what one set of folks believe is is just or unjust is isn't always the same belief as others, right? And so when you have to struggle with like Am I operating in an unjust way, given someone else's beliefs, culture, or religious practices? And do I lean into that and consider that as I move throughout, like as I move throughout the world, right? As my authentic self. And I think some of these some of these questions has come up because many people would say that 
the officer who killed George Floyd, that was justice, right? He was sentenced, that was justice. No, it's not. What would have been just is if George Floyd continued to live his life into old age and raised his daughter. Um, but then we're abolitionists, right? So then we say like, well, we don't believe in jails and prisons, or, but we but we believe enough to want this person to be sentenced to jail or prison. And so it's very complicated because when you say like, you know, killing or taking a life, even if it is an animal, is just wrong and it's a justice issue, then I would have to position myself in a learning position to want to understand, well, what is unjust about it? What is the justice issue? And then what is my role, right? Now that I know, I can't unknow it. And how do I respect that culture um, and those lessons? I think that's how I would, would approach it. But um, yeah, just Lisa, the question around justice really is always powerful. challenging for me. If I could just ask, kind of a complicated question in there. So what does one do if one belongs to a tradition, in the case of myself and, and Kashif, in which a practice of the tradition, and by the way, this isn't just Muslims and Hindus, I'm, I'm using this illustratively, right? But a central practice of the tradition, virtually a requirement of the tradition, is, is something that is viewed as a violation of justice by another tradition, which, as you suggest in kind of a learning posture, I can absolutely understand <clears throat> something suffers when an animal dies for human food, right? And it is, it, it is virtually a requirement of the tradition. And, and this, this is not the only instance. This is not the only instance, right? Many Concert, many Catholics would say that life begins at conception and that it's not their choice. They don't choose when life begins. They, they, have, uh, they, they have learned the truth and they are following it. And many Reformed Jews would say, that's not true at all. And you're attempting to advance that view is a violation of my freedom. And part of what I'm openly struggling with, with, with uh, warm and intelligent friends here is what happens when the practice of a tradition is viewed as a violation by another? And honestly, why don't we talk about this more? Right, like why is the word social justice used as if everybody agrees on what it means when actually we all know different identities have different definitions of justice. Dev? <coughs> yeah, I really, I really appreciate that what you had to say about this and, and also you Tamisha. Um, for me, there's an element of justice that's about judgment. And, you know, we think something's right and something's wrong. And in my tradition, we're always seeking a balance between judgment and compassion. And I think that's the question that I have to bring to, to, to what you're presenting, Ibu, is how do we approach um, tensions between different traditions from a place of compassion? When we're approaching those tensions from a place of compassion and when we're approaching them from a place of judgment. And I think there is a place to bring in the judgment and the ideas of justice, but I think the place of compassion and to me, what you said about being in a place of listening, that there's a reason uh, in, a, in a particular religious tradition, there's a, tr there's a, a practice of um, offering a part of an animal that's been killed or offering up a whole animal that's been killed. That traditional way of being in reciprocity and returning the gifts that were given to, to the source. I think the questions that are seeking to understand why and what's underneath it and what's the relational framework that is often in a, in a, a 
rooted in a place of love and reciprocity, um, that that can help us to understand each other, even if we don't end up having the same practice, or even if our practices and our positions are seem to violate of another person's tradition, we can hold that in a different way from a place of compassion, I think. Thank you. So I didn't want to take up all this time with just with just my question. I hope it was interesting to others as well. We, we are in the final minutes here. I would just ask uh, um, uh, Greg, Ben, Kasha, if you have um, uh, thoughts, um, appreciate Pat and Tamisha and Deb sharing on, on the, op the the first question. But Greg, Kasha, Ben, any any kind of closing-ish thoughts on what uh, panelists said or anything else that's come up for you during during this time on questions of how faith and secular leaders can work together for for some vision of justice, recognizing there's different definitions thereof? Thanks, Ibu. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, I, this, this is, you know, your question is sort of what I try to get at with the story that I brought up where the, the secular <clears throat> working with the, you know, they had this sincere conviction that, um, you know, artistic expression and freedom of expression was paramount, right? And then the Muslim students, um, I, you know, to me it was obvious that that their sincere conviction, you know, is please don't use your sincere conviction to literally force me and others to trample on mine, right? And um, you know, the, the, it wasn't me that worked it out. The students worked it out themselves. Um, but what I wanted to sort of emphasize was um, the thing that I've learned from it and, and from all of these sorts of dialogues is um, the group, the, the people that I want to talk to are the ones that can sort of understand uh, the, the imperfections in their own tradition. Like I frankly, don't like being around my own <clears throat> fellow humanists and atheists and secularists if I'm in a group of humanists and secularists that like think that humanism and secularism is perfect. It, it's it's just unpleasant. Um, and I'd much rather be among other groups where, you know, I can learn from them. Um, and, you know, and, and I think it, it, there's a challenge when, uh, an extra challenge when you're in a group where you're actively facing oppression, right? And I, I don't want to speak much of anything to this other than to say, though, that, that if you look at Ben's example, um, and I, I heard in him echoes of my friend, the Reverend Jeffrey Brown, who's done some similar work. Um, there is, you know, there's an acknowledgement there that like, oh, wait, you know, we're Christian clergy, you know, who are going to learn from non-religious young people. And I just thought that that's extraordinary. And, and when I first saw Reverend Brown talk about that, I was like, I've got to follow you. You're my hero. And, you know, he just opened up this new window into Christianity that I'd never seen before because he was acknowledging his own traditions, failings, and, you know, sometimes to reach out to people that I might consider part of my tradition. And so I just think that that's a, a resource that we have is to acknowledge our, you know, our, our, uh, I like to acknowledge my own lack of, of perfection because it makes me feel better to, to be able to listen to other people. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, go ahead, Kashi. Uh, I, I just wanted to say, I, I appreciate this conversation and, and Ibu, you, you said something, uh, you, you posed the sort of question, I think you said it in passing is why aren't we having this conversation? And I think the reason we're not having this conversation is because it's incredibly difficult and people don't often like to <clears throat> engage. I think that one of the things that when I look at uh, the you know progressive movements, one of the things that I really want uh, to see is conversations like this because I've thought about these questions so frequently um, because you know we're all humans and we're you know you're you're bringing different traditions and you're bringing different values to this sort of larger movement. And I think that one of the things that I'm really hoping that we can do more of in these types of conversations is actually challenge what it means. You know, your example of sort of the the offense, you know, of of killing an animal. I think about that all the time. That's that's a, it's a very that's not something that can be discounted. Um, and I don't have an answer for it. I, I definitely don't have an answer for it. Um, but I do think that the more we can engage 
in these types of conversations to at least try and approach, I think um, someone said around compassion. To me, that is, I really relate to so much of what everyone said, you know, Greg, you talked about not wanting to be around people who think that, you know, sort of whatever ideology uh, or, or, or tradition is sort of perfect. I feel that often all the time is because these things are incredibly messy. And I really hope that we can sort of use this time and use these friendships um, to further these conversations um, so that we're not just blanketly using terms like social justice or progressive or, or, or things like that. The, the awful as always, Ben, take us out. We're, we're at time, yeah. so perfect closing statement opportunity. Well, you, you know, you, that's a tough, uh, tough dynamic to give a black creature uh, a moment to be concise. <laughs> but what I, what I will say, and as a disciplined one, hopefully, I disagree so much with the sentiments of all my relatives here. And the notion, I think, of, of just and unjust, I think is, is not a helpful framework all the time when we're trying to think about the human experience. Um, I, I, I think the invitation is, can we hold on to our binaries loosely, more loosely, um, yeah. because we are very complex uh, people as human beings. So how can we hold on to the, these binaries more loosely? How do we actually recognize it? And difference is actually an opportunity that is um, and as Greg, uh, notion that we never disappear in this, right? The notions of race and gender, sexual gender identity, religion, physical ability. These are very real things that we have to sit with. But I think as Tamisha was saying as well, uh, there's an opportunity for us to continue to learn. And so I think the, 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 the commitment to relationship and the commitment to us being open, um, even when we're in disagreement uh, and finding that third way is something that hopefully will be uh, a journey into a future that we all can belong to. So, so grateful to be able to learn and listen uh, and stay on this journey. The perfect closing for a, a, a set of mutual learners. Thank you so much. Appreciate all of you. Uh, um, look forward to seeing you elsewhere in this conference and, and go in peace, friends. Thanks to all of the community who gathered to, to be a part of this with us. Bye-bye, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.